Okay, everybody. Um, welcome to the Jewish Study Center. Um, I'm Jerry Garfinkel. I'm the treasurer of the Jewish Study Center. And before I get into my spiel, I will apologize once again for our delay. We've had technical problems. Our, our presenter has a new computer and the computer doesn't want to sh show his face. So, um, but he, he can talk and he can share a screen. So he can give a, a great talk, but you won't, you won't see him though. Okay, so again, um, I'm the treasurer, and as treasurer, I want to tell you that our classes are free. Our instructors are very good, even though they may be invisible. And um, we do have expenses, though. So we do encourage people to make donations. We do not require it, but we do encourage it. If you want to make a donation, go to our website, www.jewishstudycenter.org and you click on donate, and then you can donate either through your uh, credit card, with your credit card or your PayPal account or by check. If you cl uh, uh, click on check, the website will tell you where to, uh, where to uh, send your check to. Okay, um, as you probably have noticed that this class is being um, recorded. So after the session is over, I'm going to delete the portion that came before I started speaking. And I will post the recording on um, YouTube, and then I'll send an email to everybody, everybody who's registered, whether you're here or, or you're not here, and you'll get the, uh, the link to the recording. Now, everybody is muted, but we do want your questions and your comments. Please write your questions and your comments in the chat box. Address it to everybody. Sometimes you make a comment and someone else will comment on your comment, et cetera, et cetera. So address it to everybody. When the presentation is finished, uh, Mindy Reiser, who is our vice president, will look at all your questions and she'll make up some of her own and we'll have a, a, a large uh, Q&A session. Um, I also, or oh, somebody, uh, somebody has set up the light language. I want to set up the uh, the uh, ca closed captions. What? What's with closed captions? Closed captions. Okay. I think I think closed captions is now set. Uh, uh, set. It should be fairly accurate um, since we're using English language. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce the introducer. And uh, this, uh, the, the uh, talk is about the Catskills. I'm from the Catskills. And my sister, who still lives in the Catskills, knows the presenter. She knows the Catskills also. And she will introduce the uh, topic and the speaker for today. So my sister, Sheila Lashinsky, will now come on. Sheila, it is yours now. You. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Okay, John Conway was born and raised in Sullivan County and educated at Georgia Institute of Technology. He was an adjunct professor at SUNY Sullivan College from 1998 to 2016, teaching a course on Sullivan County history. And he's taught the history of the Catskills for various elder hostel and lifelong learning programs. He is the founder and president of the Delaware Company, a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to promote and support the history and historic landmarks of the Upper Delaware River Valley and beyond. John is the author of nine books, has written a weekly We don't hear you, Sheila. I think I lost Sheila. I think Sheila has and other print and broadcast news organizations. He founded the Hurleyville Sentinel newspaper in 2016 and still serves as the editor in chief. John has hosted radio talk shows and has approved and has appeared on TV shows in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain discussing Catskills history. 
He collaborated with the Times Herald Record newspaper on a series of award-winning video documentaries, many of which are available on YouTube with titles such as Classic Catskills Flagler, Classic Catskills Laurels, and Classic Catskills Loomis. And I'm adding also that John is our Sullivan County Encyclopedia. I am forever asking him questions and he always has an answer to anything dealing with Sullivan County and the Borschfeld. And I love going to his office in Hurleyville to pick up a few more copies of the Hurleyville Sentinel newspaper since my brother Jerry and I attended school in Hurleyville, which now is the Sullivan County Museum and Historical Society that can really make you feel ancient, but still enjoy the memories. Now it's my pleasure to introduce John Conway, who does exist, he's not just a ghost, and he's a, a man of many hats. John, I and he's good looking too. Well, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not intentionally hiding my face. So can we see the screen now? Can we see my slides? Yes. Okay. So, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, before we get started with the with the topic at hand, which is laughter is the best medicine, the Borscht Belt in American comedy, I think there needs to be a couple of of definitions gotten out of the way. You know, the Borscht Belt is a really hot topic these days. And I've been interviewed dozens of times over the last few months about the Borscht Belt. And I think a lot of it stems from uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. But there's there are great misconceptions about what the Borscht Belt is. And I think there are great misconceptions about the cat skills and so i wanted to start out before we get into our uh, presentation to just address those terms because i think most people uh, have a vague idea of what they are but really aren't too sure let's start with the cat skills and the fact of the matter is that unless you are jewish and of a certain age the Catskills have nothing to do with Sullivan County. The Catskills are well north of Sullivan County. It's northern Ulster County, Greene County, maybe a bit of Delaware County. Possibly by the broadest definition, the very northern part of Sullivan County is, a, is a part of the Catskill Park. But the Catskills, for everyone outside of New York City um, of a certain age, is uh, everywhere but Sullivan County. If you're Jewish, if you're from New York City from the 1920s to the 1970s, certainly the Catskills mean only one thing, and that is Sullivan County and a tiny little piece of Ulster. So there was a whole other resort industry that took place in the Catskills that had absolutely nothing to do with Sullivan County and certainly nothing to do with the Borscht Belt. The Borscht Belt is another term that gets bandied about. And as the official historian, I'm a little bit of a stickler for the correct definition, or at least what I think is the correct definition of the Borscht Belt. Uh, and the fact of the matter is the Borscht Belt is a tiny sliver in time and space in the history of Sullivan County. So not all of Sullivan County was part of the Borscht Belt, and the Borscht Belt was kind of a fleeting time period, I think, and, and I, can, I can make a case for this if someone really presses it, um, that really took place probably in the 1920s and perhaps early 1930s. And once we get beyond that, I think the notion of the Borscht Belt becomes passe, and certainly the hotel owners at that point were trying desperately to escape the image of the Borscht Belt. They wanted to be mainstream. They wanted to appeal to more than just uh, that generation of Jews from New York City and, uh, and move beyond the image of the Borscht Belt. So I, I think there are some people who would define the Borscht Belt and what I call the golden age, which we'll talk about in a minute, to be synonymous, I think they are not synonymous, and I think they they may overlap a bit, but the Golden Age came about after 
uh, the restrictions that resulted in that Borscht Belt connotation uh, were lifted from the hotels. We can talk more about that later if someone uh, wants me to go into detail, but let's get into the talk. So laughter is the best medicine. And the reason I chose that topic, um, I actually have two presentations about comedy uh, in the Borscht Belt. The other one is called Hold the Chicken and Make it Pee. And that's an old Catskill joke. Um, but laughter is the best medicine because the, the Jewish culture at that time was one of misery and one of, you know, escaping the, the pogroms in Europe and living in squalor in New York City on the Lower East Side and working and never being able to get ahead and then coming up here and and being able to be someone that you probably weren't in reality, but you could be anyone you wanted when you came into Sullivan County and stayed at a hotel for a weekend or a week. And laughter became the best medicine. Laughter was the way to deal with all of the misery uh, in a lot of these folks' lives. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think when most people um, think about the Borscht Belt and comedy uh, and um, I think Borscht Belt Entertainment goes well beyond uh, comedy, but um, comedy seems to be the, the biggest part of it. They think about people like Henny Youngman. Uh, they think about uh, people like those listed here, uh, from Joey Adams to Henny Youngman, Jonathan Winters, Jackie Wakefield, uh, Robert Klein, Jackie Leonard. And I think that there's a major problem with that. The problem is that there were really two very different and very distinct eras in Catskill Entertainment history. There was the pre-war, pre-television era, which takes place in the 1930s and early 40s, when aspiring entertainers worked full-time on the staff of a specific hotel. And their, their salaries were paid by the hotel. So whether we're talking about Moss Hart and Dory Sherry at the Flagler or Danny Kay at the White Row or Joey Adams at the Nemerson, um, they were on the staff of a specific hotel and they were honing their craft there. But as television comes onto the scene, they uh, television makes stars out of a lot of these people. And now they're no longer willing to work for peanuts on the staff of the hotels. And so that's when you see them coming back and performing on a show-by-show -show basis. And we see uh, booking agents come into being and we see acts being booked for, you know, a Saturday night here and a Sunday afternoon there, or maybe a weekend at, at one of the big hotels. And, and some of the larger hotels are spending $25,000 a weekend sometimes for entertainment. But that's very different um, from that earlier era. And I think it's the earlier era that is much more interesting and that we will dwell on more because that's when the hotels really uh, employed these guys and they were really learning their craft. Uh, just as a, a, a refresher for a lot of people, um, I think it's important to understand how tourism evolved in the Sullivan County Catskills. Uh, if we go back to the early part of the 19th century, the county was very industrialized. The main industries were tanning and bluestone quarrying. Still, timber was a big industry. Uh, very little thought was given to tourism, but a very interesting thing happened in the 1830s. Um, because of a magazine article that appeared in one of the national sporting publications of the day, about the largest trout in the world having been caught in White Lake, we begin to see a massive influx of fishermen into Sullivan County, into White Lake specifically, in an attempt to break that record of a six pound trout, which was unheard of at that time. Um, and White Lake becomes our first resort. By 1845, enough of, enough of these fishermen were coming into White Lake that a man by the name of J.B. Finley builds the first summer hotel. And by the way, at this point in time, no one has given any thought to Jewish vacationers. That notion is not even a glint in anyone's eye. So 
We'll talk about that a little bit later. So these are all Gentile hotels. There's no need to be restricted because there's no, uh, there are no Jewish vacationers on the horizon. So J.B. Finley builds the first summer hotel in Sullivan County in White Lake, 1845. By 1848, the White Lake Mansion House opens up. Finley's hotel was not successful. Uh, it fails. Uh, but the White Lake Mansion House continued. And by the way, that building is still standing. And that is the oldest summer hotel still standing in the county. It dates to 1848. So that's really the beginning of tourism here in the county. It coexists with this very industrialized county. By 1865, when the Civil War comes to an end, our tanning industry um, declines greatly because the Union Army no longer needs the kind of leather that they demanded during the war. Uh, there were alternate ways of tanning leather than using the hemlock that was so prolific in Sullivan County. And by the way, we were also using up all our hemlock. So the tanning industry declined, bluestone was declining, and we begin to see the railroads being built and they begin to promote tourism as the main industry in the county. And so for about 25 years, the county is in this great transition. And the arrival of the railroads and the construction of these resorts by 1890 has led to now tourism being our number one industry. And we enter into this period where tourism is very profitable. It defines the county. Uh, there are three railroads bringing people up here and promoting the area. Uh, the O and W, which is what will be our most influential railroad, that serves the center of Sullivan County, including Hurleyville, which Sheila mentioned earlier. That uses the slogan of "Doctor Say Go to the Mountains," and that's the the promotional campaign that the O and W uses for decades, and that particularly appeals to these Jewish immigrants who are beginning to flock into New York City to escape what's going on in Europe, in Eastern Europe. And many of them are getting sick. And so when our Silver Age finally collapses in 1915, and there are lots of reasons why that happens, we can get into that if you want, but I'm gonna just gloss over it for now. Uh, we enter into another transition. We have lots of hotels, about 200 of them, and literally thousands of farmhouses that had been taking in borders that are now for sale very cheap. And we see Jewish immigrants, uh, Jewish families coming out of New York City and buying up these properties. And the Grossinger story is, is the perfect illustration of that. 1914, the Grossinger families living on the Lower East Side can't scrape together two nickels despite working really hard. Celie Grossinger, the patriarch of the family, gets sick. Doctors say go to the mountains. He's, they scrape together $450 with the help of the Jewish Agricultural Society. They buy a farm in, in um, Ferndale. And they come up here with the intention of farming. The old timers used to have a saying, how do you tell when you get to Sullivan County? There are two stones for every dirt. It's virtually impossible to farm in the county. And so they learned that pretty quickly. And that first summer of 1914, uh, they were able to take in nine boarders, mostly family members and friends of family, and they grossed $81. And that was a windfall for them. And so they have a family meeting and they decide this is the future. And it just happened that Malka Grossinger, who was the matriarch of the family, had come from an innkeeping family in Europe. And so she knew how to run a, an inn. She knew how to cook. She knew how to take care of people. And so that's where the Grossinger empire began in this very modest Longbrook farmhouse in Ferndale, which by 1919, they had outgrown, uh, even with an addition and even with buying the property next door. And so they, they now... Uh, leverage all of the money that they have and they uh, mortgage the, the purchase of a much bigger Nichols boarding house on top of the hill where we all know that the Grossinger uh, Hotel eventually is built. So that's the perfect story of how Jewish immigrants came here, mostly intending to farm. And they find out that it's impossible and that it's much easier to make a living by taking in borders 
Uh, and that's where we see the transition of all of these Gentile hotels and farmhouses to Jewish owned and operated. So by the time we get to 1920, 30, uh, we don't have 100% Jewish ownership, but the vast majority of hotels in that center part of Sullivan County are Jewish owned and operated and catering to other Jewish families. That is the Borscht Belt. That's what we call the Borscht Belt. That's the era of the Borscht Belt. If we back up a little bit, I said earlier, there was no mention of Jewish vacationers in the county until 1899. We begin to see uh, advertising for Jewish vacationers. A man by the name of John Gerson runs the Rock Hill Jewish Boarding House, and he begins to advertise for Jewish boarders. That's the beginning. And that's when we begin to see now restricted resorts. We see resorts that will advertise no Hebrews or consumptives accommodated. So if you had tuberculosis or you were Jewish, don't bother to, to try to um, register at these hotels. The Jewish owned hotels would have similar coding, they would say under Hebrew management. And as the years go by, those restrictions would still be in place for many years but the kind of the uh the way that they would make that apparent would be would become a little more subtle so instead of saying no hebrews accommodated uh you would see conveniently located to catholic and protestant churches make no mistake about it it meant exactly the same thing uh and instead of under hebrew management you would see dietary laws observed Again, that meant this is a Jewish hotel. Very few um, Gentiles would try to uh, apply at a Jewish hotel. And the restrictions were quite clear, and rarely was there any problem with that. Uh, by 1940, that really comes to an end. Certainly after World War II, we do not see restricted resorts any longer. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Golden Age blossomed the way it did, is that we're now Jewish hotels and, and the few Gentile hotels that remained were able to coexist and, and, and guests were able to stay at any and all hotels. For the most part, the restrictions had broken down. Now, that doesn't mean that that there weren't hotels that were almost entirely Jewish. But Grossingers, for example, will tell you that during their heyday in the 1950s, probably one third of their clientele was not Jewish. So the Borscht Belt has ended at that point, and the Golden Age lasts for 25 years, 1940 to 1965. It peaks in the middle of the 1950s. Let me tell you quickly about the 50s before we get into comedy. Um, the summer of 1952 is known in the history of Sullivan County as the perfect summer because for an eight-week period during the summer of 1952, every single accommodation in Sullivan County was booked for that entire period of time. And so after the 1952 season, we begin to see a build-out of more accommodations for more people. But never again would we have a perfect summer. I believe that in terms of the, the number of individual uh, hotels and bungalow colonies, 1953 is the peak. We had 538 hotels, 1,000 boarding houses, and 50,000 bungalows. So roughly 2,500 bungalow colonies averaging about 20 bungalows per bungalow colony. That, I think, is the peak in the number of individual operations. Probably 53 was not the peak in terms of accommodations, because while some of the smaller hotels were closing or being absorbed into larger hotels, I think the larger hotels continued to build more modern accommodations. So the number of rooms the number of guests accommodated continues to increase after 53, but I don't think we ever exceed that 538 individual hotels. So this is a little bit of a timeline. This is a whole nother program that we can talk about uh, at some other point. But what we're going to dwell on today is the period 
that starts in that transition between 1915 and 1940. And it starts at the most prestigious and most prominent hotel in Sullivan County at that time, which is not the Concord, not Grossinger's, but the Flagler. By the way, this is a, the picture you see now is the Wawanda Hotel, which was the largest hotel of the Silver Age. It had about 300, 350 rooms. Uh, it burns down in June of 1914, and that pretty much is a signal that the Silver Age has come to an end. Silver Age hotels, by the way, had no entertainment. If you wanted to be entertained, you went into town. This is a, a picture of the Liberty Music Hall, which it was the center of entertainment, vaudeville, uh, opera, minstrel shows in the Village of Liberty. So if you stayed in one of the hotels, which you can see in the background there, and there were dozens and dozens of hotels uh, in and around Liberty, you didn't get your entertainment at the hotels. You went into town uh, to get entertained, whether it was to see a vaudeville show or a minstrel show or a moving picture show or to go to a baseball game. This was all off the hotel grounds. That's in stark contrast to what we'll see happening later as we get into our golden age. Um, and as I said, it all starts with the Flagler. Uh, this is a picture of the main building at the Flagler. This is from 1919. And this is a very important slide, a significant slide in the history of Sullivan County. The Flagler was a Gentile boarding house as far back as the 1870s. It was built by a man named Nicholas Flagler who owned a tannery in Fallsburg. And it catered to some of the people who did business with his uh, tannery. But in 1908, two Jewish businessmen, uh, Fleischer and Morgenstern, buy the Flagler and they begin to expand it. This is in keeping what's going on uh, in, the, at the, in the county at the time. And one of the things that Fleischer and Morgenstern observed is that many of their guests come to the Flagler every year because they firmly believe that the Flagler is owned or operated or somehow connected to Henry Morrison Flagler, who is one of the wealthiest men in America, the founder of Standard Oil Company, partner of John D. Rockefeller. He had absolutely nothing to do with the Flagler Hotel. But Fleischer and Morgenstern were astute enough to know that that was probably not something they wanted to discourage. That was a good notion for people to have. It brought people to their hotel. They thought they might rub elbows with these very wealthy people. And so in 1919, when Fleischer and Morgenstern decided to build a new main building, they built a building that looked like Flagler's buildings in Florida. Flagler was building all of these hotels in Florida and he was influenced by the Spanish mission style. And so we see a mission style building in this picture that Fleischer and Morgan Stern build in 1919, open in 1920. And because the Flagler is the most prominent of all of the hotels, all the other hotels begin to emulate it. They copy. They want to build a mission style building as well. And we begin to see it morph into what becomes a very unique architectural style in Sol in. Sullivan County called Sullivan County Mission Style Architecture. Uh, if you look at this building on the right, this is at the Flagler, stark contrast to the older building on the left, which is very Victorian. Uh, the building on the right is a mission style. It's got these Palladian windows, these windows with the fan-shaped tops on them. It's stucco, so the finish is a stucco finish, supposedly fireproof. It's got these parapets at the top. So if you squint your eyes a little bit, you think you're looking at the Alamo. Uh, and it's got the name of the hotel. If you look carefully at the center parapet there, you'll see the name of the hotel. And this becomes kind of obligatory for, for Sullivan County hotels. Virtually every hotel building that is constructed in Sullivan County between 1920 and 1935 is built in the mission style or Sullivan County mission style architecture. What begins to happen, though, from this classic mission-style building that we see here at the Flagler, we begin to see an infiltration of architecture from Eastern European synagogues. And that's what morphs 
this classic mission style into Sullivan County mission. Another slide of the Flagler, it was pretty large. Um, we'll, we could talk about architecture another time, but the Flagler in 1929, um, as it undergoes major expansion every year, builds a, a playhouse, builds a 1500 seat theater. And you can see it here in the picture. Uh, they begin to emphasize entertainment. And this is the first hotel that really begins to offer entertainment to their guests. And they hire this man as a young man. He already was building a reputation for putting on shows. Uh, Moss Hart becomes their social director. And he's got a young assistant by the name of Dory Sherry. And together they put on the entertainment at the Flagler. And now every hotel, again, wants to be like the Flagler, not just architecturally, but also in, in offering entertainment. And so we begin, begin to see every hotel trying to build playhouses, trying to put on shows. Uh, and this is where we begin to see the, the, um, the advent of, of Borscht Belt comedy, stand-up comedy in the, hot the hotels. Uh, Moss Hart and Dory Sherry, uh, uh, I would hope, need no introduction to people. Uh, they go on to great careers in show business. Dory Sherry becomes president of MGM. He's a, a screenwriter. Moss Sherry produces, or rather Moss Hart produces a number of shows on Broadway. He's a playwright as well. And um, uh, they move on from the Flagler pretty quickly. In fact, Moss Hart hated the mountains. Um, he was not a big fan of the Catskills. But White Row is a, is a great example of a, of a smaller, medium-sized hotel that emulates the, the uh, Flagler, begins to emphasize entertainment to the extent that they build this massive entertainment hall. This is their casino. And the rest of the hotel is rather modest. But for entertainment purposes, they have this very modern, huge building. And they, they have a man named Nat Lickman, who is their social director. And one day, Nat Lickman is in Brooklyn visiting some relatives, and he stops into a local drugstore to make a phone call. Remember the days when you didn't have cell phones, you had to go into the corner drugstore to use the payphone. That was the most popular place to use the payphone. And when he comes out, there are a couple of young guys performing on the street corner, and he sees them singing, and they bill themselves as red and blacky. And he goes up to them and says, hey, you know, I run entertainment at a hotel up in the in the Catskills. Maybe I got a place for you this summer if you come up and join me. So we've got uh, uh, David Kaminsky and Lou Reed are the two guys. Um, and they uh, come on up. Actually, his name was Lou Eisen at the time. He becomes Lou Reed. Uh, and Danny David Kaminsky becomes Danny Kay. They go up and get jobs at the White Row. And Danny Kay really is born at the White Row. People say the first show he ever saw, he was in. And that happened at the White Row. The Danny Kay that we all know, that persona, is born at the White Row in 1929. He begins to develop that shtick, that frenetic kind of comedy that we all associate with Danny Kay. And by the way, I mentioned that Moss Hart hated the mountains. At one point, Moss Hart was producing a show on Broadway and they were trying to cast the lead and someone said, what about this guy, Danny Kay's a song and dance man. He's building quite a reputation. And Moss Hart's response supposedly was, I don't want a Borscht Belt comedian in my show. Uh, that's, that was the disdain he had for the mountains. But White Row is another one of those small hotels that had a huge entertainment staff. Here's Danny Kay at the White Row. He spends six or seven years there. Uh, he then leaves uh, and he goes to the President Hotel, which was a, a little bit bigger hotel in Swan Lake. You can see a picture of the President here. Um, and um, he's billed there at the President, not just as Danny Kay, but occasionally as Danny Corbin. And this is kind of par for the course with some of the entertainers. They would use a number of different names. Sometimes they're under contract at one hotel and they want to perform at another. And so they'll use a, a fictitious name. Now, the President Hotel actually has another claim to fame. And that um, is uh, as the hotel where a very young Jerry Lewis makes his debut as an entertainer. 
Uh, Jerry's parents, Danny and Ray Lewis, uh, were entertainers. They worked at hotels in Lake uh, 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 Lakewood, New Jersey, and and in the, throughout the the Borscht Belt, um, primarily at the uh, at the Ambassador Hotel. But they were working at the President in the early 1930s, and they were actually performing at a benefit for the local fire department when they conceived the idea of bringing their young son, Joey, who was about six years old at the time, bringing him up on stage and uh, having him sing, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And they contrived it to look like it was all spur of the moment. And they just came up and performed off the cuff. Uh, but it was all very well rehearsed. And little Joey comes up and he knocks them dead. He's a great entertainer, even at six or eight years old. And he gets this applause that uh, impacted him so much. He's such a neglected little kid who, who has such a, a great um, need for affection, a need for acceptance, that when he hears that applause, he decides right then and there at the age of six uh, that he's going to be an entertainer for life. And that's where really where... Uh, he starts. Now, I'm sure you've all heard stories that Jerry Lewis began his career at the Browns. And I've had people tell me, oh, yeah, my dad remembers him waiting on uh, their, their ta his, the, his table at the Browns, or he, he busts tables with Jerry Lewis at the Browns. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you right now, that never happened. Jerry Lewis never worked at the Browns. So if you come away from tonight's performance with any single idea, that should be it. Jerry Lewis never worked at the Browns. Jerry Lewis is working uh, as a busboy, as a waiter, as a tea boy uh, on the athletic staff. All took place here at the Hotel Ambassador, which was another hotel in Fallsburg. And the Ambassador was owned by the Merle family, but they always hired managers. And the manager, uh, the managers of the Ambassador in the early 30s were. Um, a couple by the name of Charles and Lillian Brown. And Charles and Lillian Brown hire Danny and Ray Lewis as entertainers at the Ambassador. And Danny and Ray Lewis come with their young son, Joey Levitch, in tow. But they're so busy entertaining and practicing, rehearsing and whatnot, that little Joey is very much neglected. And so Charlie Brown feels very sorry for him, and he kind of takes him under his wing. And, and uh, Charles and Lillian have a daughter who's just a little bit older than Jerry named Lonnie Brown, uh, who becomes Jerry's best friend. And together, Jerry uh, and Lonnie work on an act for him, and he becomes an entertainer while he's performing other jobs at the Ambassador. Um, but by the time Charles and Lillian Brown buy the Black Apple Inn in Loch Sheldrake in 1944, Jerry Lewis has left Sullivan County. He's left the Borscht Belt. He's left high school. He's gone out on his own to become an entertainer. He's performing in Canada. He's performing in Atlantic City, in Lakewood, New Jersey. He's all over the place. He's not waiting tables or busing places. Now, he does come to the Browns Hotel quite often. And, of course, they use his likeness on the billboards on Route 17, both Old 17 and New 17. The billboards abounded with Jerry Lewis's caricature saying, Brown's my favorite resort. But he doesn't ever wait tables at the Browns. He's already an entertainer. And when he would come to the Browns, uh, they would often arrange for him to come up on stage and perform. And usually this was made to look very impromptu, much like his appearance at the President Hotel when he was six or eight years old. Whoever was entertaining that night at the Browns would say, oh, wow, look who's in the audience. It's Jerry Lewis. And they would bring him up and he would do a little shtick, supposedly off the cuff, but it was all very well rehearsed. And, you know, I think it, maybe this is a good time to say that much of what the Borscht Belt, the Sullivan County Catskills were, were about, was really a lot of smoke and mirrors, a lot of Hollywood kinds of, of shows. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was not all reality. There was a lot of, of smoke and mirrors about what went on at the, at the um, 
uh, Sullivan County Resorts. And that was just part of it. So here's a much more modern picture of, of Brown's Hotel. As it becomes uh, a bigger, more modern facility, you can still see those two towers, though, that are in the center of the picture there, just to the left, uh, which were very much a part of the of the old um, Black Apple Inn. So if we go back here, uh, you see the two towers um, that defined the Black Apple Inn in the early Browns. You can see how they've stuccoed over the old Victorian style hotel, begun to try to emulate the mission style. They've they've sort of gone to the Palladian window. Uh, at least a mock Palladian window look on their porch there. Uh, and then here it is, is a much more modern uh, building, but you can see those two towers are still there. So Jerry Lewis becomes quite synonymous with Browns, although, uh, again, his, his um, debut and his formative years come at the Ambassador. And many people remember the Jerry Lewis Theater Club at the Browns, and there's a great story attached to this, uh, which I'll tell you. So, uh, you know, obviously, once we get into the 1950s, Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin uh, have formed a partnership and they become one of the biggest Hollywood uh, uh, draws in the nation. Lew uh, Martin and Lewis are huge uh, movie draws. And so um, when their movie uh, Never Too Young comes out in 1955, uh, uh, Charlie Brown gets an idea to have the world premiere at his hotel. And he calls up Jerry and he says, how would you like to premiere the hotel, the uh, movie at the hotel? We can have a Jerry Lewis day. And this, of course, appeals to that need that Jerry always had for recognition and for acceptance. And he, he uh, agrees right away. Charlie says, I'll pay for everything. And so uh, Jerry... Uh, agrees to have the premiere of You're Never Too Young at the, the Browns. Uh, the only problem was he did not bother to ask Dean. When he goes to Dean and, and bounces the idea off him, Dean says, I don't care where you have it. And basically, Dean meant it doesn't matter because I'm not coming one way or the other. The partnership was already on uh, the its last legs, and Dean was pretty much he had one foot out the door. Unfortunately, uh, they still had contracts to do some movies, and so they couldn't just leave each other. And, and so the last couple of movies were quite strained. But Jerry comes up, and they actually have the premiere of the movie here, and they unveil the, uh, the theater club. But this is not, by the way, what originally was unveiled at the Browns. It was actually this because no one knew at the time, this is a very rare photograph, by the way, um, and this was probably only up for a, a matter of days or weeks, uh, the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis uh, Theater Club, um, the Playhouse, uh, because the partnership was in effect ending. And so this Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis Playhouse reverts to the Jerry Lewis um, Theater Club. And what they do, uh, obviously, Martin and Lewis make two more movies after You're Never Too Young. Partners uh, is one of them, which is kind of ironically titled when you think about it. But they had already broken up. It was only because they had uh, these contracts that that they went ahead and made the other movies. So that's kind of the, the Jerry Lewis story. Uh, Jerry would come back as a big star, but obviously w only a few of the hotels could afford him. And here he is at Grossinger's. There's a great story, you know, about uh, about um, the the end of the relationship between Jerry and Charles and Lillian Brown. Uh, at one point, as Brown's hotel was uh, falling on hard times, as most of the the Sullivan County hotels were, uh, and eventually they would uh, declare bankruptcy, uh, they sent Jerry a check for fifty thousand dollars for all of those years that he that they used his likeness to promote the hotel and that he came and performed uh, gratis at the hotels. Um, and the check bounced. And Jerry was so incensed by that, he cut off Charles and Lillian Brown. He didn't speak to them. Uh, they both died uh, without 
uh, the ever, ever mending that relationship. And Jerry was very despondent uh, in with, with the fact that both Charles and Lillian died without him ever uh, mending that fence. Uh, he, they died with, with, um, you know, bad blood between them. So that was, um, was sort of a, a, a sad chapter in Jerry's life. One of many sad chapters, I think, for Jerry. Uh, but while only the large hotels could afford Jerry Lewis, uh, even small and medium-sized hotels, as I said earlier, were beginning to build huge social staffs. Paul's Resort in Swan Lake, I don't know how many of you may remember Paul's, uh, but it was a, sort of a small to medium-sized resort. They would have a social staff in the late 30s, early 40s that comprised 40 or 50 people, not just entertainers, but wardrobe people and sound men and so on and so forth. And that was fairly typical of a small and medium-sized hotel. Uh, the social director at Paul's Resort was a man by the name of Murray Janofsky. And Murray Janofsky was an aspiring entertainer uh, who goes on to quite some career uh, on movies in, in movies and on television um, once he changes his name to Jan Murray. Uh, but uh, Murray Janofsky is the social director, and he rules this 40-man and woman social staff with an iron hand. And he is the one who is supposed to get the laughs. But among the many people who work for, for Jan Murray, and here's a little bit of, about Jan Murray. I'm sure most of you, if you're around my age, you know Jan Murray quite well as a game show host. He made a number of movies, um, did some television shows as well. Uh, but among the people who worked for him, and probably the last person you would ever think of when you think of Borscht Belt entertainers, was Van Johnson. And he comes to the Sullivan County in 1938 as a redhead, freckle-faced young boy from Newer, uh, from Newport, Rhode Island, um, you, you know, who's about as white bread and, and Gentile as you can get. But he is an aspiring entertainer, and he hires on at Paul's Resort to work for Murray Janofsky. And there's a great story attached. And I mentioned earlier about one of my presentations about Borscht Belt comedy is entitled Hold the Chicken and Make It Pee. And that revolves around a story that involves Van Johnson, who, by the way, unlike Moss Hart, who, dis who really had disdain for the Catskills, Van Johnson always said it was the finest training ground you could get. He loved talking about his years, uh, his one year at the um, at, at the uh, Paul's Resort. But uh, the way he made his debut, uh, he was supposed to be the straight man in a routine that involved Murray Janofsky. And the way it was supposed to work was um, that Murray Janofsky was the waiter and Van Johnson was the customer. And the waiter comes up to the customer and says, what kind of soup do you want? We have two kinds of soup today. We have chicken soup, we have pea soup. And the customer is supposed to say, I'll take chicken soup. And then the waiter hollers out, one chicken soup coming up. And then the customer is supposed to say, wait, I changed my mind. Let me have the pea soup instead. At which point the waiter says, hold the chicken and make it pee. And that's supposed to get the laughs. But Van Johnson is so nervous at making his debut, he says, instead of saying, uh, I'll have the pea soup, he says, hold the chicken and make it, and make it pee. And he steals the line from, from Murray Janofsky, who is furious. And he makes Van Johnson pay by giving him very menial tasks for many weeks after this uh, for stealing the laughs. But Van Johnson, uh, uh, an entertainer in the Catskills that you probably wouldn't think of. Alan King or Erwin uh, Nyberg is another uh, um, Catskill entertainer, probably someone you would identify more with Sullivan County. And he makes his debut as a young uh, teenager at the Hotel Gratis in Kiamisha. He also performs in Mountaindale. But at the Gratis, um, he's, he's a teenager and he actually is is pressed into uh, going on stage one night to fill in. We hear this story about a lot of 
of young guys who are forced to fill in for an entertainer who doesn't show up. And uh, Erwin Nyberg goes on stage and he, he does pretty well. He gets a lot of laughs and he does so well, in fact, that he figures he deserves a raise. So he goes to the owner of the, gra of the uh, hotel gratis and he says, I, I want a raise based on what I did last night. I did great for you. And the guy said, what do you mean you, you want a raise? You're 15 years old. I'm not giving you a raise. Get out of here. You're lucky I don't fire you. And so that night when he goes back on stage, uh, he's got a new routine. And he says, you know, I learned a valuable lesson today. I learned a lesson that when you work at the gratis, you work for gratis. And the owner fired him, came out and fired him on the spot. I suppose that's when he went to the new prospect in Mountaindale. Uh, but this is uh, Erwin Nyberg at the Hotel Gratis. Red Buttons works at a little place called the Beer Kill Lodge. And Joey Adams was working there at the time. And he writes in his book, The Borscht Belt, which, by the way, if you really want to understand Borscht Belt comedy and its evolution, read that book, I think, from 1966. Joey Adams, The Borscht Belt. He talks about how they come to him at the Beer Kill Lodge and they say, I had to hire my nephew. His name's Aaron Schwatt. Uh, put him on, see what he can do. And Red Buttons actually turns out to be a pretty talented guy. You know, he's not just an actor, but he, he's a, a musician and a, a playwright. And he's got quite a few talents. Um, goes on to win quite a few awards at di in different walks of entertainment. So uh, far from being hired just because he was a nephew, he's pretty talented as an entertainer. Uh, this is uh, a, a little group photo from one of the publications uh, that Sullivan County used to promote its tourist industry. And uh, again, I think this is part of the confusion because you've got here people who worked at the hotels uh, and people who were just making appearances at the hotels. And they kind of lumped them all together. And I think that's doing a disservice. Uh, Sammy Fain's a great story. I don't know how many of you know the story of Sammy Fain, but Sammy Fain grew up in South Fallsburg. His father, uh, Abraham Feinberg, is actually the first cantor in the South Fallsburg shul when they start the shul. Um, and Sammy Fain, as he goes on to become famous as a, um, uh, you know, a song maker in Hollywood, and he he wins Academy Awards, he still comes back to the family hotel, a very small place in South Fallsburg called the Fane Lodge. And he performs there. He tries out some of his musical numbers. They could not have paid for that kind of entertainment. How, how do you, how does a small hotel like that afford an Academy Award winning um, uh, a musical guy like Sammy Fane? And yet here he is playing at the Fane Lodge. So uh, this is what the Catskills were all about, the Sullivan County Catskills. Here's another familiar face. Uh, and this is a great example of a guy who comes up to the Catskills. He's a 14-year-old saxophone player at a small hotel called the Hotel Anderson just outside Monticello. And one night, the entertainer doesn't show up. I see Jerry looking at his watch, so maybe I'm running out of time here. You're going to give me the hook, Jerry? Um, Sid Caesar fills in for the comedian and he's a big hit. And so he decides right then and there, he's no longer going to be a musician. He's going to be a comedian. And he uh, ends up marrying into the family that owns the Avon Lodge. But obviously he becomes a big TV star and he can no look that the hotels can no longer afford to employ him, but he does come up and act puts on, you know, one night stands at these hotels, including the Avon Lodge. But that's a story of how an entertainer becomes famous because of television and then um, is now booked on a night by night basis. Lots of stories about Jack Barry being a Borscht Belt entertainer. I have to tell you that I have found absolutely no record. I'm not saying that it's not the case but I have found no record of Jack Barry, the well-known game show host who gets caught up in the game show, the quiz show scandals. I find no record of him uh, working at any of the hotels. It's possible, but I, I don't, uh, I can't say where he worked or when. 
Judy Holiday is a chorus girl at Gross Singers. And here's the great story, Jean Carroll. Not sure how many of you have heard of Jean Carroll, but if you are a fan of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, who I think is responsible for the rebirth of the Borscht Belt, which is one of the hottest things going right now because on her TV show, they visit the Catskills and she's great, but she is a real life Jean Carroll. Jean Carroll is a Jewish entertainer, starts out as a very young girl, eight, nine, 10 years old, playing in vaudeville. Her real name is Zygman. She goes on, she's uh, billed as Cindy Zygman. But one night, uh, the, the guy who's putting her on the stage for her vaudeville performance says, you know what? We've got the German-American Bund here tonight. You're going to be Jean Carroll. Can't use the name Zygman. And so she becomes Jean Carroll forevermore. And she is really the real life Mrs. Maisel. She's not just a stand-up comedian. She gets her own television show. It's not successful as it turns out, but she's the one who paves the way for I Love Lucy and Eve Arden and all these other comedians. It's Jean Carroll, the real life Mrs. Maisel. And by the way, Jean Carroll marries a, another entertainer by the name of Buddy Howe. And they perform together for a while. And then Buddy Howe drops out of the act to promote her. And they lived in Wurtsboro, uh, Yankee Lake, for many, many years um, into old age. Buddy Howe dies in the 1980s. Gene Carroll just died fairly recently, but continued to live in Yankee Lake. Many of you know uh, this face. He's a well-known opera star. Uh, Robert Merrill, but Ma Robert Merrill got his start here in the Catskills. Again, not who you would think of as a Borscht Belt comedian, but he performed at Young's Gap, worked there for many years. Uh, he would later say, I not only sang, I did comedy. I performed as a straight man, danced in the finale. During the week, it was suit and tie, but on weekends, strictly black tie. On Saturday nights, I would do the big aria, from the Barber of Seville, it always stopped the show. And Meish Miller was able to save his money from working summers at the hotels to put himself through voice lessons and whatnot. He becomes a huge opera star, but he starts working at the Young's Gap in 1938. Very, very well-known entertainer who gets his start um, in the Catskills. Shelley Winters, as Shirley Schraft, gets a her start as a chorus girl at Grossinger's, another uh, Borscht Belt entertainer. Here's a well-known face. I'm sure you all know this gentleman, Robert Klein. Probably not often thought of as a Borscht Belt comedian, although he performed at all of the hotels uh, on a night-by-night -night basis. But he also, prior to that, had a job at one of the local hotels uh, Robert Klein actually worked as a lifeguard at a, a small hotel in Woodridge called the Alamac. I'm not sure how many of you might remember the Alamac, but when I was a kid, I would draw, uh, ride with my parents through Woodridge. And as you came down Glen Wild Road into Woodridge, the Alamac was on the right. And their big pool was right there by the road, right by the stoplight. And it was the biggest pool I'd ever seen as a little kid. And little did I know that Robert Klein was a lifeguard there. And, and part of his comedy act, he often talks about being a lifeguard at the Alamac and particularly this one incident that took place. One day, a young boy is in the pool and he dr he's beginning, he's drowning in the pool. And Robert Klein jumps in and saves him, pulls him out, administers CPR or whatever, and he saves the young boy's life. And subsequent, later that day, the young boy's parents seek him out and they come up to him and they give him five bucks. They tip him five dollars. And Robert Klein always made a joke out of that. You know, was that what the boy's life was worth? Five dollars? What if he had drowned? Would they still tip me? And he has like this whole routine that, that revolved around him being a lifeguard at the Alamac Hotel. I don't know if you're familiar with his book, but he wrote a book, which I think he recounts that that incident in his book. It's called something like the amorous, the amorous bellhop of 
Decatur Avenue or so something like that. Uh, that's Robert Klein's biography. Even Jerry Seinfeld would come up and work at the hotels, but his roots here go deeper than that. Jerry Seinfeld was a young student at SUNY Oswego, and he decides to drop out because he wants to become a comedian. But he used to drive through Sullivan County constantly to get to Oswego from his home in Queens. He eventually goes to Queens College and gets his degree, but He's familiar with the Sullivan County hotels because of driving through here. And he used to sneak into the Brickman and watch the performers entertain. And that's where he honed his act. He, he would learn stand-up comedy from the comedians who are performing at the Brickman because he could sneak in there and he could watch them perform. And that's how the Seinfeld routine, which, you know, he's got a very distinct form of comedy. That's where it all took shape was watching the performers at the Brickman. Here's a picture of the Brickman, which was one of the finest of the uh, medium-sized hotels here in the mountains. Very well-kept, beautiful place, run by the Posner family. Started out uh, as the Pleasant Valley Farmhouse, as a small boarding house, and grows goes through that mission-style phase, becomes a much larger hotel with these modern buildings. Uh, the Brickman is uh, just a great hotel and hung on a lot longer than others. Here's a, a picture of it in its earlier incarnation. You can see the Mission style building there in the middle and some of the old Silver Age amenities that held on uh, for many, many years after they still had the baseball diamond and the riding stable, which very few hotels maintained as we get into the into the Golden Age, where the Silver Age was all about um, natural beauty and the outdoors, the golden age, um, really, um, it's not about that at all. It's all about the man, the man made, the man built environment. It's about, uh, 24 seven entertainment. It's about food, uh, golden age hotels. I always say were site independent. So where a silver age hotel would, would need a body of water or a great view, uh, from a uh, from a mountain peak or something like that. Golden Age hotels didn't care where they were located at all. I think the Concord is the best example of that. The Concord's located on one of the most beautiful lakes, uh, Kaimisha Lake, and yet only in the very early years did you ever uh, see the Concord mentioning the lake at all. Uh, it really was, the Concord could have been anywhere. It really didn't matter where it was located. So I thought I'd close with a few uh, classic Catskill jokes. Uh, last year, I took my wife on a trip around the world. This year, she says, let's go someplace else. Bada boom. Uh, a drunk was in front of a judge. The judge says, you've been brought here for drinking. The drunk says, okay, let's get started. A doctor gave a man six months to live. The man couldn't pay his bill. So he gave him another six months. The hotel I'm in has a lovely closet. It's a nail. There was a girl knocking on my hotel room door all night. Finally, I let her out. That's one of my favorites. I don't know. I played a great horse yesterday. It took seven horses to beat him. The horse I bet on was so slow. How slow was it? The jockey kept a diary of the trip. Those two are a fastidious couple. She's fast and he's hideous. Folks, I'm here all week. That's kind of my presentation. Uh, be happy to try to answer questions, but remember, laughter is the best medicine. Thank you, John. I'm still laughing. And by the way, some of the comments in the chat was, I hope John goes on for hours. <laughs> so Mindy, are you want to go back? I, I can't see those uh, chats, Jerry, but can, do you want to read them to me or no, maybe no, I can no, do no. this? No, uh, we'll, we'll save them. Uh, let's see. I need to be made visible. And I, 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 well, he's, um, he's sharing the screen. So I, I'm spotlighting you, but you won't be, you won't be visible unless you on. Folks, okay. Some of you were, were great contributors to this and we will save this. And for some of you, this will be a wonderful memory uh, for important parts of your life, which are now coming back. 
All right, lots was covered, and uh, there is unanimous feeling that uh, John has got to return, that there's so much else to talk about. But let me pull out a couple of things here. Um, first, it, it, again, you could touch on so many dimensions. Who actually was working in the hotels during the different periods? Um, we had different populations, but can you give us a sense of who were the people who were the, the servers, who were the cleaners, um, who were the uh, people at the front desk? C can you give us a little bit of a sense of that world? Sure, you know, that's a great question. And just as the hotels evolved, and you know, that's another great story, which we can talk about at some point, is just how the American vacation evolved. So when the hotels in Sullivan County were strictly summer only hotels. They depended upon uh, college students mostly for their help. Local people obviously would work in some of the jobs, but where you needed to have um, interaction with the guests, oftentimes they were young college students. You know, there used to be a saying, I'm sure you've all heard it. There's not a dentist in New York City who didn't wait tables in the Catskills. But that changes when the hotels become year round. And what we begin seeing after 1940 is that more and more of the hotels are becoming year round. And that's when we see in the, in the 1950s, we see an influx of African-Americans into Sullivan County. As late as 1940, we had fewer than 100 African-Americans living in Sullivan County. But the Brickman Hotel, again, is in the forefront of that movement. Uh, ben Posner, who owned the Brickman, had a chef who worked for him named Sam Marin. And Sam Marin was um, one of those guys who worked at the Brickman all summer. And then in the winter, he went to Florida and he worked at the hotels down there. And he mentioned to, to uh, Ben Posner one time that, you know, there are all these workers who work in the Florida hotel industry in the winter. They don't have work in the summer. The hotels are not busy. And so Ben Posner sends money to a, to a small group of these African-Americans and they come up and work at the Brickman. And we begin to see a massive influx of African-Americans from very specific places in Alabama, uh, Uniontown, Alabama in particular, Bay Manette, Alabama. They come up, they work at the Brickman, and then the Irvington takes on some. And from there, it begins to grow. And then soon, we begin to see the advent of employment agencies, and they go into the city, and they go down to the Bowery, and they say, you, you, and you, come on up. And unfortunately, many of these workers they bring up and put to work in the hotels don't last very long. Maybe they only last a few hours. Maybe they last to their first paycheck when they go out and get drunk. And now they lose their jobs and they become burdens on the social uh, services um, uh, uh, offered by the county. And this is a, a real problem develops here in the county. But that's a, a, an answer to your question is originally mostly Jewish college students. But as the hotels change, uh, that changes too. And we begin to see uh, more and more people coming into the county, uh, eventually Hispanics as well, uh, to work in the hotels. Well, that's fascinating. Again, that's a whole other presentation. One of the participants um, in the past uh, hour and a half, almost, uh, wanted to know about the non-Jewish folks who came up. Um, some of them, I'm assuming, were the backstage people uh, in terms of wardrobe and props and all that. But you did mention Van Johnson. Were there some other young men and women who were part of the entertainment cadre who were not Jewish? I don't know of any. I'm sure there must have been. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, and of course, we, we have the whole phenomenon of the Gentile Hotel, which doesn't just cease to exist. Obviously, during that heyday, the Golden Age, there are very few, probably the Columbia in Hurleyville uh, was the most famous of the of the Gentile hotels, but there were lots of others as well. Um, 
And while they did not emphasize entertainment to the extent that the Jewish hotels did, and, and especially not comedy, uh, there were, you know, obviously musical entertainers and, and, uh, and, and, and drama shows put on at those hotels as well. And, and you know, we didn't mention the whole, the whole industry of places, of, of uh, phenomenons like the Stanley Wolf Players, who would be a group of, of, um, of actors and actresses who would uh, contract to play at a bunch of different hotels. They put on a few shows here and a few shows there. And that's how uh, Bernard Schwartz got his start, who goes on to become Tony Curtis. He plays with the Stanley Wolf players. And they would live with local people in the community and they would put on shows at various hotels, but they didn't actually work at any given hotel because you know they worked at they put on shows where hotels could not afford full-time social staffs let's say and they would contract with places with uh groups like the stanley wolf players so that's a whole nother phenomenon that we could talk about okay uh, you so while i am sure there were other gentile entertainers i'm not uh I, i'm not aware of any that i can Okay, you you've people. touched on on some of this, but again, all of us knew many of these names, not personally, but in terms of the research you've done and the tales that have been told to you, talk a little bit about the interplay between these people who are now or were at a certain point stars, but had their beginning as young men and women beginning, their interaction with the guests. Did they enjoy get, getting out there during the day and, you know, socializing, get, going to the pool, uh, getting involved in sports, or did they keep to themselves and then just come out for their performances? I'm sure it varied, but any tales you have on that, I think, would be quite interesting. Well, yeah, in the, in the early days when they were employed at the hotels, uh, they had very little personal time. Their job was to entertain even in between shows, they were supposed to be entertaining at the pool or entertaining in the dining room. And, you know, this was the job of the Tumbler. And I think Mel Brooks probably analyzes it better than anyone else. And obviously, um, he's another Hurleyville alum. He worked at the Butler Lodge. Uh, but he, he talks about how uh, the, the Catskill uh, Hotel audiences were such a great training ground because they were really tough they were <laughs> tough on these these folks especially before they became famous but even you know even when we're talking about big name entertainers the catskills was known for how tough uh their audiences were at the concord for example they used to rate the quality of the acts um and in particular i guess the lack of quality of the acts by uh, how many doors to the nightclub were used to exit during the show? So if you did a two-door show, that meant that enough guests left that they had to use two doors. And I'm told that the worst performance ever at the Concord uh, in terms of, of the number of doors was a four-door show that was put on by, believe it or not, Ray Charles one night. Uh, he was just so bad that people left in mass and they needed four doors <laughs> to exit. And that's the only four door show that was ever performed at the Concord. Uh, I'm told I, I was not there to witness it, but uh, that's that's the the, the off repeated tale of, of the Concord. So really tough audiences. Um, but but sure, in the beginning, lots of interaction, lots of interaction. And I think, you know, oftentimes there was uh, a, a tendency to work the audience into the show itself. When you're a tumbler, you depend on the audience. And I think that's where Simon Says would uh, come into play, become a popular uh, part of the entertainment because it's an interaction between the, the social director or the tumbler, uh, the performer and the guest. And things like that become commonplace. The guest becomes part of the entertainment. Now, remember that this all starts in those very earliest days of Jewish uh, vacations here in the mountains before 1929. 
before the Flagler starts that trend uh, to to offer, you know, real well-defined entertainment. The guests were more or less left to entertain themselves. That's when you see, if you ever watched The Rise and Fall of the Borscht Belt, Peter Davis's film, you see, you know, there were mock weddings and things. That's what passed for entertainment. The guests entertained themselves. So there was still a, a, a certain amount of that carrying over into the early days of the Tumler and the entertainer, I think. So, uh, but again, just as everything else evolved, so did that. And so did the relationship. Certainly once the big stars were coming back to perform at the hotels, they did not interact with the guests. You know, they're already big stars. So they're not rubbing elbows with, you know, Jenny from the block. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can't go on too much longer, John, because I think you your energy might flag, but who knows? Um, okay. You mentioned uh, Sam Fine. And the fact that he actually uh, was a cantor in a synagogue in South Fullsburg. Can you say a word about how rabbis looked at the goings on in the Catskills? Obviously, people were there for lots of purposes. Husband hunting, wife hunting was one. Other kinds of liaisons was a probable agenda as well. What was religious life like there? And what kind of oversight? did rabbis have on what was going on well I, I you know that's probably something that i'm i'm not the one to really address i can tell you that services were a part of many of the hotels uh gross singers when like certainly sorry, when what? what we say services uh oh, on, okay. the, on the on the uh on shabbos were yeah. part of of life at the hotel so uh, at Grossinger's, when Malka Grossinger was alive, that was mandatory on Friday night. You went to shul uh, on the hotel grounds. And there's a great story about Barney Ross, the boxer. When uh, Grossinger's began to uh, bring uh, boxers up to train, um, uh, Malka Grossinger was not very impressed by Barney Ross, uh, who was a young Jewish guy from the city. Uh, but she she couldn't understand why anyone would try to make a living uh, fighting. She thought he was a drunk or something, that he couldn't get a real job. And then one Friday night, she sees him in the shul, and she gets to know him a little bit, and her attitude changes completely toward him. So um, although I, you know, I, I think with a name like Conway, I'm probably not the, the right person to address your question, but I can tell you that certainly um, you know, people did not forget their uh, their religious background when they came to the hotel. Certainly not during the Borscht Belt era. Perhaps when we get into the the later years of the fifties, um, it might have been less of a of a of a routine at the hotels to have Jewish um, services and whatnot. Because I think. There was a, a more of a mixed clientele. So, uh, but, but I, I'm really not, I, I don't know specifically how to address that. Okay, hey, that's fine. All right. This well, is interesting. Some hotels were religious and some hotels were not. And they're all kosher, but but some of them you could not enter on, on Shabbos and, and they had services. Other hotels, like we only had services during Passover or high holidays. But you can come in and out, you can drive, whatever. And think most hotels were like that, I think. Yeah. Okay. Of we're course, getting... There was a big there was a big scandal when Laurels, the Laurels, which at that time was the largest hotel in the mountains, uh began to offer lobster on their menu and broke away from the the, uh -huh. the kosher um, you know, and all the traditions of, of uh Jewish dietary laws. And that was a huge scandal for uh, but, but eventually, many of the hotels followed suit. Yeah, uh, I remember that I went up with my family for, for Passover, for Pesach, um, which some people did at, to a hotel. And that was kind of a special time also. Okay, people do want to know what's left of, of the grand hotels. Are any of them still functioning? And um, None still functioning. Hmm? None still functioning. 
Kutch's was the last one, I think. Yeah, the, there are none functioning. There are still some buildings left, but even even you know fewer buildings every day. We just lost the Homawak that burned uh, just the other day, and prior to that, pines burned down. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of talk about um, the fires, and of course the old uh, cliche about Jewish lightning and so on and so forth. We're 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 seeing that re-enter the vocabulary here of a lot of locals. Um, I, I tend to um, shy away from discussing that because I think it's oftentimes um, very misunderstood and, and it, it, there's a misconception about it, but um, we're losing more and more of the hotels. So Brown's burned, uh, that's barely recognizable any longer. Uh, Stevensville is still pretty much intact. There's absolutely nothing left of the Concord, Grossingers, or Laurels. Those were the three biggest hotels in Sullivan County. If you cross over into Ulster, and, and I've always maintained that little sliver, sliver of the town of Wawarsing in Ulster County really should be considered part of Sullivan, but the Neville and the Falls View are still standing. And by the way, the Falls View is still operating. Uh, it's now Honors Haven. Uh, it's still operating. It's quite different from what it was um, as the Falls View, but it, it's still recognizable. And so is the Granite. So the Granite is now Hudson Valley Resort, but it's barely recognizable. The Raleigh, I guess, still operates uh, from time to time in a uh, strictly uh, orthodox, uh, dealing with strictly orthodox um, clientele. I assume the Falls View is no longer Slutsky, right? <clears throat> no longer. No, no. I think Korean people own it. Okay. Well, this has just been fascinating. And the more you talk, John, the more questions and comments people have. We will save the chat. And I think that will be kind of a precious memory for people. Any last words you'd like to convey, John? And then we'll go over to um, a former. I think Sheila wants to say something. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I remember many years ago, um, the Villa Roma, which was not a Jewish hotel, when a lot of the hotels were burning and, you know, for Passover, they wanted to uh, kosher the kitchen. And unfortunately, they had a fire in the ovens, I think, because of the... John, am I... Do you remember anything about that? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. They leased it out for, for Passover, and they were uh, using the blowtorches to... Uh, I'm not sure of the term, but to convert the kitchen, and they set oh, fire sure. to it. So and, uh, yeah, they damaged Villa Roma. Now, Villa Roma is still operating, but in no way was Villa Roma part of our... A Borscht Belt history. It was a, a very small boarding house, Gentile boarding house, until well into the, the 70s when it really began to grow. So uh, I don't consider that. Uh, last words you asked me for. So let me say two things. One, I think these are these are the critical things to remember. One, uh, although it's, it's great to remember places like the Concord and Grossingers and Laurels, the backbone of the Sullivan County hotel industry were were hotels like uh, Sheila and Jerry's parents owned those small, medium sized uh, 500 hotels that were like that. That's the backbone of, of our economy. It wasn't the big hotels. They were few. Uh, there were only a handful of those. Uh, and then lastly, I would say what I'd like people to come away from, uh, from this program with is, you know, what I said earlier, Jerry Lewis never worked at the Browns. <laughs> Got to remember that. But yes, please say it I thought his father, Danny, worked at the Browns. Well, okay. no, he never did. Okay. They, they might have performed there, but they never worked on the staff. I don't know if Danny might have, he might have worked on the staff, I guess. I don't know. I don't think so, though. But Jerry Lewis never worked at the Browns. You know, and, and I say that somewhat facetiously, but I think. What I mean by that is that don't be don't be fooled by all of these misconceptions about 
the Borscht Belt and the Catskills in Sullivan County. Uh, the truth is not always what it appears to be. And I think the Jerry Lewis story is the perfect example of that. You know, everyone, when when Jerry Lewis died, everyone said, you know, best known for the Browns, so on and so forth, got to start at the Browns. And just like Dirty Dancing was, you, you know, Brian Williams telling everyone that Dirty Dancing um, was was based on the Browns. Um, lots of misconceptions about the Borscht Belt. Don't get your history from Hollywood, I always say. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting we're talking tonight when there is probably going to be a, a strike that will uh, silence Hollywood for a while. So, Can I ask uh, one question, yeah. please? Uh, John, what about Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds and Grossinger's? I mean, was Eddie Fisher an entertainer there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, well, you, you remember Judge Cook. I know you were a legal secretary, oh, yeah. so yeah. Judge Cook actually married them. So, uh, yeah, that was they were quite the couple, and uh, I believe they met at Grossinger's. Um, and and then, of course, I, I think he uh, Eddie was also there with Elizabeth Taylor from time to time. Um, yeah, that's a whole – you know, we could do a whole – Listen, there's probably 25 different programs I could do just based on stuff that's come up tonight. So maybe you need to have me back at some point. Absolutely. John, I remember when uh, Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds had the premiere of their movie in the Liberty Theater. When I was All right. There. I yeah. promise if we do it again, I'll try to get my uh, camera <laughs> working. In okay, the well, I think we have to end it now. Um, this is the last uh, class we're going to have for the, for for this uh, season, we'll, we'll we'll resume again with uh, some classes. That not as, maybe not as interesting as this one, but we'll have classes in September. And thank you uh, again, uh, John. That was one great presentation. Maybe we'll have a second presentation. Um, we had a very large audience, and as far uh, what I'm going to do, as I said earlier, uh, I will um, put the recording on the uh, um, YouTube, I'll send an email with, with the recording a link, but I'll also uh, attach the uh, chat to it so people can see the chat. And the chat will also be uh, posted on our website. So the chat will, <laughs> will remain. There are lots of interesting comments there. And uh, you also see it, John. I'll send it to you also. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a great night. Uh, great comments on the chat. Uh, great history from John. And thank you, uh, Mindy and, and Sheila. And also to uh, uh, John Lester and Victoria uh, Khan, who helped, uh, you know, uh, admit people, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I hope to see many of you uh, in September. Have, the, have a great rest of the summer. And keep cool. Thank you. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Okay, thank you. <laughs>